So as Anna said, I will talk today about macroecology, some studies that I've been developing in this research area. I hope you'll not be bored with the things that I will tell you now. I will try to not be so technical, try to be more, go to the results of, of the, these studies and, and we can discuss further. So I would like to start uh, with this year, 1989. It was a very important year for the world. It was a benchmark because it was the year of the fall of Berlin Wall. But for us, ecologists, it was a very important year as well. And for me especially, because it was the, the year that they published this paper in science. Brown and Maureen published this paper that defined macroecology as a subfield of ecology. Since then, a lot of things have happened, a lot of data have been accumulated, and now we have a, a science, a macroecological science, very different from what we had before. And I will try to, to give you some examples of things that we can do in macroecology going beyond and the descriptions of large scale patterns of biodiversity. So in this study, the motivation for do this, it was that in the Amazon, we have a very uh, unique environment because we have by large rivers and when I say large rivers it's that these rivers they, they have a, a, a wide of one kilometer or more two five ten kilometers or more so this environment it's very interesting because these these rivers they create like um, regions of endemism in the Amazon indeed the first person that observed that these large um, interfluvial regions like Guiana, Inambari, Rondonia, they create areas of endemism. The first person was Wallace, Alfred Russell Wallace. He observed that this, these rivers, they act as barriers for the, for the, movement, the, the movement of monkeys. After Wallace, there was a lot of people that was working with Amazon organism, Amazonian animals, and some of them has tested and has corroborated this uh, river in barrier hypothesis. So I was very interested in knowing if this river in barrier hypothesis, if, if it worked for our dragonflies and dancing flies, and why? Because um, this, these suborders of Odonata, um, dragonflies and, the, and themselves flies, as you can see, they are very different. The zygoptera, the smaller ones, they have small body size, slender body sizes, and they are not so good in flying in comparison to the dragonflies. The dragonflies will have very big uh, animals. Some of them are capable of migrate for thousands and thousands of kilometers. And so I thought that it was a, a very interesting organism to try to test things like this. But I was, I was not testing um, endemism per se. I was more interested in, in, um, in a theoretical framework called, called community assembly. So in this case, I was interested in know if these biogeographic barriers and the environmental filters like the climate, like other local conditions, if these, these factors, these different factors or process, they were important for the, for the local diversity of these Odoneta communities. So for that, what I, I did, we, I, we, I performed, the, uh, I used a methodology called network modularity analysis to try to organize these, these communities by their the similarity. In and then I used a methodology called SEM, structural equation models, to understand the relationship between the predictors, they are affecting the, the species richness in the local communities. 
So this is part of the results that we had in this study. If rivers, in fact, act as, as barriers for these species, we would expect something like this, 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 this interfluvial region, Guiana, because uh, each pie chart uh, are all the streams, all the Odonata community in, uh, in an interfluvial region. Each module is it's it's compiled of of communities that share a similar community composition. So it means that this is a very particular community composition in comparison with the other interfluvial regions. In this case, for the Anisoptera, the big the the, the big size Odonata. You can see that we have um, that the species they are very diffused across the interfluvial regions. So what can we say from from this this figure? That the composition of the Goptera community is more similar within interfluvies than among interfluvies, indicating that several species, but not all the species, are restricted to particular interfluve, as is the case of Guiana. And for an isoptera, we found that extremely similar species composition are scattered across the interflux, indicating that these species are indeed capable, uh, able, able to disperse among interflux. So the second part that was trying to evaluate the importance of environmental filters in this uh, species richness of local communities what we found is that for Anisoptera and for Zygoptera, the climate, it's a very important filter for these uh, local communities and these reg regional as communities as well. But for Zygoptera, there are other filters, other local scale filters like the stream depth that are also important for, for the, the species richness of these communities and of these uh, meta-communities. So the conclusions, the take home message of this, of this study is that anisopteras follow an environmental filtering process with the effect of climate on larger spatial scales. Metal filtering process. Several species show smaller uh, species ranges and are limited to single Amazonian interflux. And also that the local filters are, are important for the diversity of zygoptids. So the second and the third study, I will try to I, I Evaluating diversity gradients. I'm interested in evaluating the quality of microecological data. I will try to, to show some, some methodologies that we can use to be, uh, to be sure that our data is good or not, and how can, can we, we can deal with these uncertainties. So in the second study that we developed in the Museo Nacional de Ciencias Naturales in Madrid with Chris Ronquillo, this uh, project is within a, a, a great, a big project named United. I think Fernando, that guy right there is working, is also working in this project and Elena as well. So, um, this project, the, the big aim is to try to understand the adapt adaptability of mosses to uh, climate change. But the first step was to understand the Iberian mosses, but the first step was to understand what data we, do we have in the Iberian Peninsula? E, are, is this data good? How is the quality of the, of the data that we have in uh, Iberian Peninsula? So what Chris done. She she downloaded a lot of records from GB. She also used data from uh, catalogues, and she compiled and filtering all this data. I think it's more than 80,000 80, records that we have. 
Then the objectives of our business study was to assess the overall quality of this data of the most record uh, records in the Iberia Peninsula. Also evaluate the altitudinal, temporal, and spatial coverage to know if we have if we have some biases in this data. For example, if, if people prefer to go to the top of mountains or no, or people like to, to be near the, in the, the ocean, to try to understand the bias in, in this data. Analyze their inventory completeness. I will explain further what, uh, what is it. And assess the adequacy of good data of the good inventories with, uh, within this large database. Uh, if this good data, they are, um, they are good to, to, to recover the responses of moss to climate and land use changes. So these are, this is a, a, some results. For example, uh, for attitudinal coverage, we can see that people like to, to make their service here between 80, 80, 80 hundred meters and uh, 1,600 meters. Uh, regarding the temporal coverage, we have a very interesting result here because if you see uh, in this uh, time frame, in this period between uh, 1940 and 1960, it was uh, the Spanish uh, dictator, I don't know how to say in English, like, dictatorship. dictatorship. Dictator, thank you, Raquel. So it's a Spanish dictatorship. And so we can see that in this period, the, the science did not advance as much as uh, we would like. And then, the, as was expected here in 2000, with the new technologies, with the, the progress of ecology, we have an a, a increase of, of records of, of the Iberian mosses. So uh, in these figures, we can see the spatial coverage of this data. In the upper uh, side, we see the number of records as uh, blue, low number of records, red, a high number of records. And below, we see the observed richness. And we can see that we have um, a high richness here, I think in Asturias, in in this region of Spain, some something right here. Uh, the other part was to evaluate the inventory completeness. What is this? It's to know if this the inventory completeness is a metric based on the rarefaction curves, but um, in a in a simple way, uh, one hundred percent completeness is. It means that our observed richness, that richness that we go, we went to the field and we collected the individuals and, and the species. So if this observed richness is equal to the estimated rich, uh, richness by these algorithms, uh, it seems that we have 100% of completeness, that we made a very good, uh, um, a perfect uh, sample, uh, sample inventory. And what we see here is that we have very good inventories in here in the Levante of Spain, in this area. We have here in the north of Portugal, very good inventories and some, some other here in the center of Spain and in the south. And it's interesting that it coincides with uh, important research groups and PhD pieces that be, have been developed uh, the, during this time. It's important to say this data, we make a, a, a we filter this data just uh, between 1970 and 2018 because we, it was the, the time frame that we have more data available. And because our GIS layers, they are not so old. For example, uh, word clean data, it's from the 70s, the, 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 the models that they, they develop, it it's begins in, in the 70s. And also other data, it's just to coincide with this data and because we have more data in this time frame. So in this case, we are interested in evaluate the, 
the climate climatic coverage of the of the well sampled inventories i mean just of the oops, just of the the red and the the orange ones because we 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 established a threshold of 70% of completeness as well sampled cells so in here what we've done we 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 took the the climate of the Peninsula Iberica, and we made a PCA, and we and we also made a PCA with the climate of the well sampled cells. And what we saw is that the good service, the good inventory, they coverage only uh, twenty about twenty one percent of the all the climatic variability of the Peninsula Iberica. So if you wanted to understand the response of, of mosses to the entire climatic variability of the Peninsula Iberica, we would need much more service uh, in places that we, in, in climates that we've not had surveyed before. And in this next slide is the, is the comparison of the well-served cells that is these ones here uh, within the in the red square, uh, square compared with the proportion of uh, land use changes in the Peninsula Iberica. The land use change we use at Corin to to quantify the land use changes. And so, what we can see from here, for example, from from the first uh, figure is that here in the center of Portugal, we have a lot of areas that have changed. Uh, and some of them are covered by, by the good service, good moss service. This is the change, but we don't know if this change, it's our anthrop more anthropized, uh, um, more anthropization or more naturalization. And here in this second figure, uh, we hear, we see the, the direction of change. Green means that in the 90s, that was the, the period of the first Corin, it was more anthropized and now it's more naturalized here in the region of Alentejo and, and Faro. And the, the others, the, the beige, the yellow and the, and the brown, they are anthropized and the intensity of anthropization. So what we can see that we, we are not covering, the good uh, inventories are not covering this naturalization process, but they are covering the, this, what was expected, the, these places that are going towards uh, anthropization. So with this data, we, we saw that we have bias in, in survey in, in most data like I think all, all the biological groups. Uh, and and this, this Iberian mosses, the research on Iberian moss, mosses requ requires more service with an adequate spatial design. And we also, we also make a call for bryologists um, for they see these maps and try to Define new areas of survey based on the on these results that we, we that I have presented today. So the third case, it's a short one uh, because it's a work that is in progress and we have started here in, in with Entropy Bio. Uh, this is a, a chapter that we are doing for for a, a book on the great escarpments of Angola and Namibia. So this, this region, this very beautiful region, it's a region that covers all the south of Africa, but we are, we are interested in the Angola and Namibia. So what we know that we know that this region has remarkable levels of biodiversity, of endemicity, but this huge biodiversity is apparently not reflected in global biodiversity databases. So our objectives, uh, we have more objectives, but for the moment I will show some results that we have 
was to characterize the temporal trends in recording for in the great escarpments of Angola and Namibia and evaluate and map the spatial bias in, re in, in recent record efforting. And in this case, we, we are using another methodology different from the, the, the study of the Iberian mosses. So just to see this data, we, retrieve, we, we collected this data, we downloaded from GBIF and then cleaned the, the data. But what is see, we have a heavy bias toward uh, birds so people go to the great escarpments to study birds and then flowering plants, uh, insects and mammals. Uh, in this chapter, we, we, we will focus only on birds, flowering plants and mammals. But I expect to do something with the insects because it was the group that I did my, my thesis and I'm very comfortable with them. So trends in record effort, we can see the, the total database, I mean, including all the biological groups, including fungi. Uh, so we have here, like for almost all the groups that I have been studying and that I see in papers, in 2000s, we have a, a, a sharp increase in, in the number of records. Uh, for birds, I think these, these are very correlated, this data, because this sharp increase is, is being driven by the, uh, the bird records. And then for, uh, plant, for, for plants and mammals, we have a, a, a bit different uh, trend of record farting in, in the great escarpments. Here for the mammals in the 70s, we have a peak. And for, for flowering plants, we have in the 90s uh, peak. So these maps, uh, as I mentioned before, I, we use it a different metric of data quality. Uh, this, the name of this metric is, are, is ignorance scores. It's an algorithm different of the, the completeness of the, the other example. But it means that uh, the ignorance, they use the records to, to calculate these ignorance scores, the records without considering species, the, the records that, that of, the, of a particular group. So as purple means that 100% uh, ignorance, and um, yellow means that we know too much about the, about that group in that place. As we can see here, we know we have a fair um, coverage uh, for birds. So that we have us here in low ignorance in, in Namibia, but if you see here in Angola, we have almost nothing in, in GBIF available. Uh, for flowering plants, we have Mm, a lot of ignorance about the, the, this group in GBIF data and mammals, we have ignorance in the, in the great escarpment. I don't want to say, it, this is not, I'm not saying that uh, they don't have, people don't, are not doing research in these places, but this data is not available in, in GBIF, that is the, the data set that, I, that we use it here. And just a spoiler, because Javi that is here, he's struggling with the GAMLAS model. He has finished, but now we have to discuss the data before, uh, before presented. But this data is mainly co uh, related to road density. I mean, uh, less ignorance, more records is very, is very related to the, to the accessibility of these places. So uh, the take home message of this study is that a uh, high number of recent bird records that we have in the great escarpments compared to flowering plants and mammals to the other groups. And a very interesting and alarming um, result is that we have a general lack of, of survey uh, effort in Angola, in GBIF, with the GBIF data. So um, the, the last uh, case study that I will show you 
it has um, I would like to to bring something that I I, I was doing in Universidad de Alcalá this paper that we are preparing and uh, it's a non-traditional method that we are, we are using to evaluate uh, large scale patterns in abundance and it's just to the messages that we we can go beyond these traditional methodologies so as I said, in, we were studying um, abundance part patterns at large uh, scales. Basically, basically we, we were making abundance environmental models, environment models. And why we're interested in studying in study abundance instead of species richness or because abundance, it's a very important uh, biological data. With abundance, we can make uh, species niche models, including um, models for invasive species. Uh, we can predict the effect of climate in a particular species or in a group of species. Uh, we can predict blooms. So abundance uh, population, work with population, it's a very important and interesting. What we have seen is that this abundance environment relationship uh, they have been assumed in, in the literature that they have this line-shaped pattern. I will show you. For example, people assume that um, abundance relationships are this way, and they use, use to model uh, abundance environment relationships using traditional metrics, traditional methodologies, I'm sorry, like uh, GLMs, like the to a linear regression because, but the thing is that this, this traditional metrics, they assume that the response is linear and it's, and it's constant along this environmental gradient. And what we have here, it's the mean response of the, of the species, the species. But what we, we have seen is that abundance environment relationships, they often take in um, polygonal shaped patterns. So we saw, I, I will show you, we saw that a lot of papers show this, this kind of shape, not this shape uh, homogeneous, but they have more this, this shape uh, polygonal. This means that if you use a linear regression, GLEMs to model abundance, we are not using, we are losing uh, some information because probably this, this relationship is weaker if you use GLM, for example. But if you use another um, different methodologies like quantile regression that, uh, that model, this upper limit, the maximum response of this species, maybe we are capturing uh, an, important, an, an important information that is where the measured factor in fact limits the maximum response or the maximum abundance that the species can attain at a particular place. So uh, in this work, our objectives was to assess the generality of these polygonal shaped patterns in abundance environment relationships, and also estimate the frequency to which these patterns, these polygonal shaped patterns, or linear patterns, uh, line partners, uh, patterns are interpreted in the context of ecological limitations. Well, I, I made a literature review and I was very interested in these scatter plots because I was interested in the shape of these abundance environment relationships. We also, I also analyzed observational data using two large databases, the forest inventory and analysis, which is a large database of of North American plants, uh, United States plants, and the bird. It's a, a, a big database of citizen size of birds. So by, by one hand, um, we make a literature review, and by the other hand, 
we make these uh, some models to test the, the effectiveness of, of quantity regression to evaluate these, these polygonal shaped patterns. What we found, we found the prevalence of polygonal shaped patterns in abundance environmental plots in the reviewed papers, as you can see in, in these photos. Uh, regarding the observational data, we found that abundance has in fact these polygonal shaped patterns and about 59% of trees have their maximum abundance limited by one of the environmental predict predictors. For birds, we found that these patterns was not so evident for birds because there's a, a difference between first uh, the FIA data and the bird data. The FIA data, it's a systematic inventory in US. They have fixed plots and they go every year and have very standardized plots in, in, in US uh, where they, they collect this information of planes. They birds, they have a lot of controls, but it's a citizen, uh, citizen science database. So this data can have a little more noise than the FIA database. But as you can see, we, we also have a polygonal shape and our results are corroborated by, by other studies, as you can see here. And with this study, what I would like to, the, the, the message, the take home message I would like to, to give is that um, with, with our mind of uh, linear relationships, generalized linear models, linear regression, maybe we are we are losing other important um, things that the data are giving us important information so there is a potential of limiting responses that is largely underused uh, it, it has been seen in the contrast between the prevalence of these polygonal shapes in the literature and in the data that we evaluated compared with the the frequency at which these relationships uh, are analyzed in this context using models that evaluate that models, the, these limiting relationships. So the challenges are because we have a research bias towards the models that estimate mean response. And, and we are not, we, we, we not acknowledge this limiting uh, response in, in our studies. So I hope you are not so bored with my, with my talk, but I would like to show something that I have been done. And, and the, the, the take home message is that macroecology, it's beautiful. It's not just describing large scale patterns and biodiversity, which it's very good, but we can make other things. We can control this data. We can use another, um, methodologies and now with machine learning all the this potential potentiality so we can get very interesting things uh within the scope of macroecology and that's it uh thank you so much